Isaiah chapter 21 through 25 this evening. In chapter 21, we have the judgment against Babylon, Edom, and Arabia. Now, if you remember last week, we shared that these judgments are upon the various nations from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 23, which I find interesting. And it just kind of, on the way here, it just like a light bulb clicked. And I said, oh, oh, wow. You can take those chapters, 13 to 23, and you, and you see God's judgment upon these various nations, you know, from Babylon to Syria, Syria, um, Edom, Arabia, Egypt, even Jerusalem. You see God judging all these nations, and, and you take this judgment, and you move it today to the tribulation period, and what's going to happen then? God is going to judge all the nations of the world again. So it's a picture, a prophetic picture of a historical event that took place during the time of Isaiah upon these nations. And then it's speaking prophetically in the future that the same thing will happen again. Now tell me that it's not true, that history repeats itself. It is true. And looking at history is very important, isn't it? We need to look at history. We need to look at what has happened in the past. And we need to then make our decisions based upon what has happened in the past and how God has taken care of those things for the future. And so we need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at those nations, and, and we'll see here, uh, I haven't had the time to do this, but if someone would want to do this, this would be great. Look at all these different nations that were judged and find out why they were judged. Uh, you'll find here that uh, the, some of these nations were judged because of their pride. Some of these nations were judged because of their wealth, their commercialism, materialism. Some of the nations were judged because of their idolatry. They created idols. Some of them were judged for different reasons. And I'll, I'll, I'll I don't want to say it bet, but I would guess for sure that if you were to look at all these nations, you would find almost every sin that we deal with today. The same type of sins. Tell me that man has evolved into something better. We haven't. We haven't at all. We ha if anything, uh, we have just repeated the past and we have tried to justify the sins by saying that there is no sin and that we are all animals. We have evolved and we should not be limited by our passions and our loves as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, of course, you know, but that we should be able to enjoy those things. No, that's not true. God has a purpose for judgment. What's the purpose for judgment? For cleansing, to setting things right, for correction. Uh, in many cases here, we will see and we have been seeing some of these nations will be judged permanently. Some of them will be judged and then restored later on. And so you see a, a chastisement in that type of judgment. God does that to the church, doesn't he? He chastises us as his children because he loves us. Just like a father and a mother loves their children, they chastise you, they correct you, they discipline you. Do your homework. I don't want to do my homework. You need to do your homework so that you can get an education, so that you can understand certain things, so that as you grow up, you will be able to get a better job. You know, you'll be able to provide for yourself. You'll be able to teach your children. I don't want to do it. But, okay, go to your room. Sit there for 10 minutes and then, then come out and tell me you don't want to do it. And you... Correct them, you chastise them to get them to do something, to correct an error and so forth. Because you love them, it's not because you hate them. Of course, they're saying, oh, you hate me. No, they don't hate you. They love you and they want the best for you. And so God does that with us. And believe me, you know, as youth, and you're going, yeah, oh boy, that's funny, that's so true. But we as adults, we do the same thing. Because God tells us to do stuff and we're like, I don't really want to do that. But God says, it's good for you. And I know, but I really like doing this. Yeah, but if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. If you just do what I say, then I will bless you. And we'll see that in some of these places here where men try to do their own thing in their own strength, in their own power. And it doesn't work. And as adults, we need to depend upon God for everything. When I pray in the morning, I always pray for the whole day. I said, Lord, you lead me and you guide me throughout the day. You help me to make the right decisions at the right time, whatever comes up throughout the day. And I pray that every morning. And oftentimes I'll go out through the day and decisions making comes my way and I have to make a decision. And sometimes I'm dealing with somebody and I know in the back of their head they're saying, well, isn't he going to pray about it? I've already prayed about it in the morning. 
Lord, you lead my day and you help me make those decisions throughout the day. But there are some times when someone does bring a situation to my attention, I have to make a decision where I then think, you know what, this one needs a little more prayer because I don't want to make the wrong decision here. So let me pray about this. Let me take it back and, and just seek the Lord on this before I make a decision. But we need to seek God in everything. And I think that a prayer like that covers it in the morning. Lord, just lead me today. Help me to make right decisions. I think that covers it. You don't have to, you know, approach every little thing. You know, someone says, hey, can you, uh, you know, take out the trash for me? Oh, hang on, let me pray about that. You know, let me say if that God's something God wants me to do. No, you know, God's going to give you the opportunity throughout the day to make those proper decisions. When we walk with God, when we invite him in, when we allow him to be a part of our lives, that's what a relationship is all about, right? Jesus wants a relationship with us. There are many here in this room are dealing with various issues. Some of you are suffering from some sickness right now, you know, and you're dealing with all that emotional stress that, that, that is brought about because of those sicknesses. You know, the doubts, the worries, the concern. Is heaven really there? Uh, we're here and we really can't touch or feel it, so how do I know it's really there? Well, the Bible tells me I know that and I know God is real and I know He's changed my life, but... There's still that little thread of doubt sometimes. And we're dealing with those issues. And God wants to be real in your life. Jesus wants to walk you through those issues, maybe financially. You know, it's a struggle. Um, you're barely meeting ends, you know, in, in payments. And Jesus wants to walk you through those things. He wants you to hold to his hand, trust in him, and watch what he does. Whatever the situation is in relationships, or other kinds of struggles, you know, Jesus wants to be there for you because it's about him and his love for you. He doesn't want to judge you. He does want you to walk rightly before his eyes in righteousness so that he can, what, bless you because he loves blessing more than anything else. That's the God we serve. So let's look at some of these judgments here and, and keep that in mind. We're not exhausting Isaiah completely. I mean, there's so much here. So I'm just kind of giving you an overview that you can take back and look at and maybe get an idea and later on just continue to build upon it. So here we see this judgment against Babylon, Edom, and Arabia. Now, Persia, Mede Persia, will be marching upon Babylon and they will be the ones that will be judging Babylon themselves. And you see that in the book of Daniel and I encourage you to read the book of Daniel and you'll see the, the um, image that was built and, and how the image represents different nations at different times and, and how these judgments came upon those various nations. Well, the Persians will be the ones that will literally judge Babylon. It says, the burden against the wilderness of the sea. Now, the wilderness of the sea is Babylon. That's what they're called. Um, <clears throat> they lived basically by some sort of lakes and marsh, so they call them the wilderness of the sea. So speaking of that nation, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert, from a terrible land. A distressing vision is declared to me. And so Isaiah gets this vision concerning Babylon's judgment. Now, this is 200 years before before ba Babylon is even judged. And so he's prophesying of a future judgment that will take place. And it does in the future. And you can go back to history and you can find out that the Medes actually did penetrate uh, Babylon and destroyed Babylon. The treacherous dealers deal treacherously uh, because they're treacherous. And the plunders, plunder because they're plunderers, go up, O Elam, besiege, O Meda. All its sign I have made to cease. So again, the ancient name for the people of Persia there is the Medo-Persians. They will have an empire that will march upon Babylon and destroy it. Now today, the Persians are modern day Iran. Iran will be one of those nations that go into Israel to destroy it along with Russia. Russia and Iran will both together go into Israel in the last days, probably the, the Magog battle, and try to take it over. Now, it's interesting because today we see an alliance between who? Iran and, and Russia, a big alliance. Um, they're now 
they made this agreement to build another nuclear power plant, but now they're also um, going to use that power plant for the UK that they're taking over right now. And so they're just slowly building this relationship, slowly getting closer to, to Israel to destroy it. And so we can see that prophetically. So Isaiah sees the Persian Empire marching on Babylon. Therefore, my loins are filled with pain. So he's talking about himself. He's a little sad in here. Pains have taken hold of me like the pains of a woman in a labor. I, have, I was distressed when I heard it. I was dismayed when I saw it. So he's having this vision, kind of like John in Revelation, seeing the events unfold here. And so he felt that he was afflicted because uh, of what Babylon was going to go through. My heart... Um, wavered, fearless, frightened me, or fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I longed, he turned into fear for me. Prepare the table, set a watchman in the tower, eat and drink, arise, you princes, anoint the shields, for thus has the Lord said to me. So prepare yourself, because this is coming. The anointing of the shields is not like oil anointing the shields, but they would literally put grease on the shields so that when they're in battles, you know, the grease would actually slip. So if they came to hit them or or throw a sword at them, it would slip off the shield and it wouldn't penetrate. And so get ready, prepare yourself, use whatever means that you have because the Lord has said, go set a watchman. Now a watchman was someone that usually sat on the wall. Usually you had a city and you had walls around the city and you had towers within those walls and you had men up on the walls looking out as far as they can to see if any armies were coming to prepare themselves. And then they would call out really loud, you know, whatever it was, whether it was trumpets and they would sound with so many blasts would tell you that there's someone coming or that things were clear, maybe even using it for time and so forth of the day. And, and, you know, so they would basically be the alarm system of what was going on around them. We're the alarm system. Ezekiel chapter 3, chapter 33, talk about the watchmen on the wall. We're to be watchmen on the wall. We're to be watching out what's going on in the world, and we're to warn the world. We're to warn our brothers and sisters in Christ of what's going on in the world. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back really soon. I think sooner than what we think. We are living in exciting times when you think about it. Just what's going on in the United States, and yet the United States even isn't in the prophetic picture. At least I don't see it. But everything else in the world and what is going on there is just amazing how it just fits prophetically within the Scriptures. And you can, you can almost... I mean, if I was a general or... Uh, some leader in the army, I would, I would be reading Isaiah. I would be reading these books and saying, this is what's going to happen. We have to watch Iran very carefully. We have to watch Russia very carefully because the Bible says they will be the ones going into Israel which will end all things. So we need to watch them. Why are we watching other nations that have nothing to do with prophetic history, right? Let's keep our eyes on them and use the Bible as a defense tool. You can literally do that because you can depend upon what it says is going to happen. That's how accurate the Bible is. And so prepare for thus has the Lord said to me, go, set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys, a chariot of camels, and he listened earnestly with great care. That's his job. Then he cried, a lion, my Lord. I stand continually on the watchtower in the daytime. I have sat at my post every night. I look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horses, horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground. Oh, my threshing and the grain of my floor, that which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have declared to you. So as a matter of fact, what God has said, I declare to you, Babylon has fallen. So this is when the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon. Now there is also a prophetic application here. Revelation chapter 18 describes the same call. Where have you heard that again? Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. You heard, you've heard that in another place, right? In Revelation, it talks about Babylon has fallen. That commercial and spiritual Babylon that will exist during the end times. It will also fall by the Lord. History repeating itself. A prophetic picture. As it rises up, whatever Babylon is, and there's all kinds of 
of suppositions uh, as to who Babylon is. You know what supposition is, right? It, it's just like um, it could be this. It, it could be uh, instead of having an objective view, a, a factual view, and you know this is what it is, you have a, a supposition view. It could be this or it could be that or it could be this. We know that Babylon spiritually will exist. We know that there will be a commercial Babylon. Who will be in charge of those things? We don't know. Will, will the United States be a part of that? Will, will Europe be a part of that? Will, will the Eastern Muslim countries be a part of that? We don't know and, and who all the players are, but we know they will exist. So we can come up with a lot of suppositions, but that's all they are is suppositions. We can't really dogmatically say that's what it is. And we need to be careful that we don't add to the scriptures. It, it's fun sometimes to think about it, and it's fun to... to kind of throw out scenarios and how it could take place, you know. And you see them with pictures and you see guys put videos together and they're, you know, making these horses and fires and flames and earthquakes. And stuff. And it could happen like that, but we really don't know. We know something like that will happen. So you have to keep that in mind. Don't take it as the gospel truth. We know that the end's coming. We know that these entities will rise up and how the details are. Leave that to God and, and during the end time. We won't even be here anyway to experience that. So the repetition of this phrase, this fallen is fallen, connects those two passages, Revelation um, 18 and also Isaiah as being the same. So he's talking there prophetically about the tribulation period. So now the judgment on Duma, which is Edom, the burden against Duma. He calls to me out of Seir. Now Seir was a mountain, the Mount Seir. Watchmen, what? Of the what of the night, watchmen? What of the night? The watchman said, "The morning comes, and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return, come back." Now, Duma, um, we really don't know a lot. <laughs> I tried to look up some things. We know they're destroyed. We know that they're judged. We know they're Edom, but we don't know why. It really doesn't say. So they're a city that is judged during that time. Um, and that's about all that we know. Anything else would be supposition. So now the judgment against Arabia. The burn against Arabia in the, in the forest in Arabia, you will lodge, you will travel companies of Danites. O inhabitants of the land of Tima, bring water to him who is thirsty. With their bread they, may, they meet him who fleed or fled, for they fled from the sword, from the drawn sword and from the bent bow and from the distress of war for thus the lord has said to me within a year according to the year of a hired man all the glory of kidar will fail and the remainder of the number of archers the mighty men of people of kidar will be diminished for the lord god of israel has spoken this is saudi arabia they will be judged now what's interesting here is they're not found in prophecy they're not found in prophecy at all they're like the United States. Though God judges them here and eventually he will restore them once again, um, they're not going to participate in the Gog-Magog situation, which is interesting because, again, as Israel, if Israel were smart, they would again look at this and say, we don't have to keep our eyes on Saudi Arabia. And right now they're keeping their eyes on Saudi Arabia, and they don't have to because they're not in the picture. They don't have to waste their time there. They need to keep their eyes on Iran and on Russia. Now, at one time, they were literally helping Iran. They were allies for a while, and that's dangerous, and they have to be warned of that. Maybe this message on YouTube will get out, and someone will hear it and, and leak it back to them that they need to keep their eyes on Iran and, and Russia and not Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia supplies all the oil. You know, throughout the world, uh, to the United States and so forth, it's not an area that that is prophetically um, important. We do see them in Ezekiel, um, and um, like the United States, they're that young lion that is an offshoot of possibly um, Europe, and so we're just kind of st standing by, watching what's going on for whatever reason. And so, um, don't have to be concerned about them. Okay, let's go to chapter 22. As he continues on with the judgment. <clears throat> now we have a judgment here on Jerusalem. 
And Isaiah is grieved over this beautiful city that has so much history with them. The burden against the valley of vision. What ails you now that you have all gone up to the housetop? So, so what's your trouble? What's going on that, that you're looking up to heaven, that you're um, concerned about? You are, or you who are full of noise, a tumultuous city, a joyous city, your slain men are not slain with the sword nor dead in battle. All your rulers have fled together. They are captured by the archers. All who are found in you are bound together. They have fled from afar. Therefore... I said, look away from me, I will weep bitterly. Do not labor to comfort me because of the plundering of the daughter of my people. So again, God's judgment upon Jerusalem. Now, one of the reasons is because they were following the other nations. They were taking on their cultures and and their idolatry and their worship. And we know that when you go back to the Torah, the first five books of Moses, he specifically gave commands on how they were to worship the Lord. Very specific. They were to worship no other gods. They were to worship God only. They were keeping the Sabbath. You know, they, they were not to take the Lord's name in vain. You know, make it, vain means emptiness. Making God's name empty. Like it me- has no meaning whatsoever. And they began to follow the other nations. And they began to forget the Torah, forget the law of God. And so God, again, now is correcting them and trying to bring them back. And of course, we know that it's all about Jerusalem and Israel, right? These are God's chosen people. Uh, He specifically took them and they're precious in his sight and he's not going to let them go, which is wonderful to think about because we're his precious people too. Peter says we're a royal priesthood and we're precious in his eyes. He loves every one of us. And so he's not going to let us go either. He'll chastise you and whoop you real good before he allows you to go because he loves you. You know, he'll bring you back. That's how much he loves you. And so we can be assured too because we love him, because we trust in him and we have faith in him that he won't let you go either. I remember when I first got saved, I was so concerned about falling away. I did not want to fall away. That was a big concern. I didn't, I didn't want to take this Christianity and, and kind of pursue it. And then down the road, get tired of it, you know, and say, it's not for me. And so one of my prayers was, Lord, please uh, don't ever let me go. I know that I would let you go. I know that that possibility is there, but don't let me go. Please, I'm asking you to promise me that you will never let me go. And it's interesting because in the scriptures it says, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. You know, and so I stand on that, that he'll never let me go. And there's been times where I wanted to go, but he just won't let me go like a father pulling me by the ear. No, you're not going anywhere. You know, the, the chain can go so long, and then he just kind of tugs you back right where he wants you. So he loves us that much, and we know Jerusalem is special to him. So he goes on as he sees this coming army, uh, and, and the Lord then brings uh, no deliverance to them because of the chastisement. For it is a day of trouble and treading down and perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of visions. Now, who is it by? By the Lord. Does the Lord bring judgment? Of course he does. He does bring judgment. Breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. And of course, he's using again Babylon to bring this judgment as a reminder. Now, Elam, who was an ally of Babylon, bore the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen, a quiver was usually uh, the thing that held, held your, your bows, your arrows. You had a bow, and you had this quiver that, that held all the arrows in there, and you just pulled the arrows out to shoot at, at your enemy. It was your weapon. Uh, Akir uncovered the shield. It shall come to pass that your choice valley shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gates. So they're coming up against Jerusalem. He removes the protection of Judah, you looked in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. Now, who removes the protection of Judah? God does. Who protects us? God does. Who can remove that protection? God can. You look at Job's life. Who, who removed the protection in Job's life so that Satan could do what Satan did? God did. So how important is it to be right with God? Very important. 
walk away from God, uh, be disobedient to God, and guess what? He could remove his protection from you. Why would you want that? Why would you want that? You, you wouldn't want that. Not when you have this divine power who's over you and protecting you, and he's on your side, and he's for you. Why would you want to remove that? Because you want to stray away, or because you don't like something that he said, or disagree with him. Why would you put yourself in that situation? Judah got chastised because of it, and judged, and many men died because they removed themselves under the, from under the love of God, as Jude says. Why would you do that? Let's not do that. Let's keep ourselves there. Let's be in confession all the time before the Lord, confessing our sins and faults. So the best thing that Jerusalem could have done uh, was, <clears throat> was to um, really change their hearts, come back to the Lord, repent, and turn back to God. But they didn't. So he says in verse 9, You also saw the damage to the city of David that it was great. You know, you go there to Jerusalem today, <clears throat> and I was standing there on the southern part of the west uh, uh, of the Temple Mount, <clears throat> and you look out to the southern part, and it's just dirt. And, and there's a lot of archaeologists there. I have to say that word very slow, archaeologists. And, and they're all there excavating. There's so much dirt mounds, tears upon tears, and they're digging deep, deep, deep down, and they're finding the city of David there. And this city, it says here, is damaged and destroyed. You know what a tear is, right? <clears throat> uh, a tear usually, uh, let's just say your house. Let's say this church. You know, here we are in, in this little community, in this little church. An enemy comes in, he takes us over. Well, instead of, instead of just removing all this, they just tear it down and put dirt over it and then build on it. And that's the first tear. And then let's say they build their little city and whatever on there. And then another enemy comes out. And well, instead of tearing it all down, removing it, they just tear it down, put dirt on it. And you have these tears just building up. And so you have that throughout Israel. Everywhere you walk, some history is there. And it's just amazing. You go deep down in the ground in the city of David, and you find these caves. But you see the, the homes and the buildings and the artifacts that, that uh, were there during the time of King David. Amazing stuff. It just blows you away to go there. I hope to go back soon. I'd like to go back before the Lord, Lord returns. But that's okay too because I'll see the new Jerusalem when it comes. <clears throat> so it's, he says, you also saw the damage of the city of David, that it was great. And you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. You numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses you broke down to fortify the walls. You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, that is a pool of Silo. Now, the, <clears throat> there's a tunnel there in Jerusalem, and, and <clears throat> it's really long. It takes you a while to go through it. You start out of the city where the water is, and you, you start your way into this tunnel, and there are times when the tunnel is big, like the size of this room, and then all of a sudden it gets about this small, and you're squeezing through there. And it's just rocks, and water runs through this place, so you have to wear shorts, you'll get wet. And then you come out in Jerusalem and you come out to the old pool of Silo. That's how they got their water into Jerusalem during times of battle. They connected a, uh, they made an a aqueduct to this crack in the rocks, you know, and they lowered it into Jerusalem so that they have water constantly. Then they covered it all on the outside so you can't see it. And so water was brought in and they were able to survive. And nobody knew how they were getting water in the city and they could last forever you know, in that place. And it's a beautiful place uh, to walk through. I've got pictures of me walking out by the Pool of Shallow, coming out of the rocks, you know, and it's just awesome. It, you can't even see in there. You've got to bring a flashlight. It's so dark in there. But wow, history. There I'm walking through. How many men and women walked down that place to get water while they were being attacked by Babylon? And there I was, you know, in there, you know, who died during those times and, and, and things, you know, just amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. But you did not look to its maker. <clears throat> now that's the problem right there, isn't it? And it's still the problem today, is that we don't look to our maker, God. We can do it on our own and in our own strength, but we don't look to God. Oh, don't worry, God, I can handle this. How many times do we wake up in the morning not seeking the Lord and taking on the day in our own strength? We need to look to our God. But you did not look to its maker, nor did you respect 
for him who fashioned it long ago. For in that day the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning, for baldness and for grinding with sackcloth. In other words, humility, humbleness of heart, true repentance. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord wants. He wants a humble heart, not a prideful heart. <clears throat> a heart that says the work that I do is, is not my work, it's God's work because he gives me the strength to do it. If I'm going to win this battle, it's going to be won with the Lord and not in my own strength. Even though they had this great river flowing into Jerusalem to help them to supply the water needs, still God destroyed them because God wasn't a part of it. And yet God made that whole crack in the, the rock so they could you know, have that water. And they wouldn't acknowledge that how we need to acknowledge the Lord, how He needs to be a part of our daily lives. <clears throat> so that's a hard thing to grasp because God will allow us to make our decisions and we can get through life okay, barely, but we make it. But we miss out on what God really intended for us because we don't invite Him in our lives. And if we would have invited our him in our lives or acknowledged him, I think he would have been doing greater things than we could even imagine and then he would receive the glory. Think of a scenario in your life where it was, it was okay, we got through, but imagine if God was involved in that, how much more you could have gotten through. Making God a part of those decisions is a great thing to do. But instead joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating meat, drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Then it was revealed in my hearing by the Lord of hosts, surely for this iniquity, its sin, there will be no atonement for you, even to your death, says the Lord of hosts. It's sin not to invite the Lord in, because it's idolatry. You're your own God, and that's satanic, actually. Uh, Anton LaVey was great at that. Do what you will, as long as you don't hurt anybody. Do what you will. You know, it's a satanic phrase. Why don't you do it your way? Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Yeah, all the way to hell. You know, you can do it your way, but invite the Lord. It's sin, and we need to confess that. Now, uh, Shebna is, is a, <clears throat> a steward of Hezekiah. And he talks about this man, Shebna, and his office and how he misused it. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, go proceed to the steward, to Shebna, who is over the house, and say. Now, a steward was one that was over the house. He was in charge of everything that his master owned. That's what a steward is, basically whether children, whether finances, whether vineyards, you know, whatever. He, could be a, he, he would be called an administrator, right, Javier? Administrator. <laughs> He's overseeing everything, right? That's what a good steward is. We're stewards of everything God has given us. How important is the job of being a steward? Very important. We're good stewards of God's resources, of God's things, of God's household, of our family, of our children's. We are the stewards of those things that God has entrusted us to. How important is that? Very important. It's important for us to understand that God has entrusted our children to us, that we train them up in the way of the Lord. It's important that God has entrusted our resources to, it, to us so that we use it properly for God's glory, for His kingdom, not just for ourselves, but as He prescribed in the Scriptures and how we ought to use them. And too many times we change the rules. We, we make up our, well, I'm the steward, I'll make up my own rules. I'll change the bylaws, you know. I'll change the contract, you know. I'll do it this way. No, God's already written it out. We just have to be good stewards of it. Now, this guy here was not a good steward. He says, what have you here? And whom have you here? What you have hewed a sepulcher, sepulcher here as he who hews himself a sepulcher on high who carves a tomb for himself in the rocks. What this guy was doing was he was using the resources for himself. He was acting like he was someone important. And so he went and bought himself a great tomb, a great sepulcher with a nice big stones and carvings and everything. And this is my place. This is where I'm going to die. This is where they're going to bury me. And people will remember me forever. 
When you're there in Jerusalem, again, looking at the city of David, you look down through the Kidron Valley, you'll see on the side of the mountain these huge sepulchers with archways and everything. And they're, they're places where people were buried in those places. He had a sepulcher. And God's saying, who are you? Who are you? Where did you come from? You know? You're no one. What do you think you have? You really have nothing. <clears throat> See, what did he do with his position? He had a position of honor and authority. And what he did with it was frivolously spend it on himself. You know, didn't take care of it the way God wanted him to take care of it. So he says in verse 17, Indeed the Lord will throw you away violently, O mighty man. You know, I, I like that. <laughs> you know, o mighty man, you think you're mighty, you think you're strong, you think you're smart, you think you're going to get away with this, O mighty man. No, it's, you're violently just going to be thrown away. He never did get buried in his sepulcher, by the way, and will surely seize you. He will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. There you shall die, and there your glorious chariots shall be the shame of your master's house. So I will drive you out of your office, and from your position he will pull you down. So <clears throat> though he sought honor and glory, he wouldn't find it. He wouldn't find it. You know, it, it's interesting how people will... Even the church, misuse the church. <clears throat> there are a lot of stories of, of pastors misusing the church, embezzling money because they feel that they have a right to it. Well, I serve hard. I don't get paid enough. Taking a little bit here and there, that's okay. I can justify that. It's all the Lord's anyway. I'm in control of it. I'm the steward of it. I'm the overseer. So why not? Because it's not right. Because it's stealing. You know? And so you have pastors embezzling money. That's not going to happen here. You know, that's Judas Iscariot, you know, a picture of him embezzling from Christ and so forth. Being good stewards of what God has given to us you know, in this church. Being sure that what ministries we have, that we're running it for the glory of God and not misusing it. So many think they'll get away with it. And they might be getting away with it, but they won't get away with it in the end. Because God sees all things. You remember when Moses saw the Egyptian and the slave fighting. And, and he was like really concerned, compassionately concerned. What is this Egyptian doing to the slave? And so it says that Moses went over there and he killed. He, it says, actually, it says Moses looked to the right and he looked to the left. You know, he, he looked to the right. Is anyone over there? Any Egyptians? Anybody, you know, over there any Egyptians? No. And then he went over there and he killed the Egyptian for doing that. There was one place he didn't look and that was up. Because God sees everything. He should have looked up and he should have remembered that God sees everything. He sees everything that's going on. He sees the secret places of your hearts. And so how important is it to be a good steward? Very important. Now what is this a typology of? When you look at this guy who was a steward, who does he remind you of? Satan. Lucifer. He was entrusted with so much. And then he thought he could be in a place of honor and respect. And God cast him down. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Elikim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibilities into his hands and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now here's a type of who? Jesus Christ, faithful. Here's a faithful steward. I'll give him everything that was yours. I'm going to give it to him. And Christ came and he took everything and took charge of everything. He did what Adam couldn't do. He fulfilled everything that Adam should have fulfilled, but Christ did it all for us, the second Adam. It is Jesus Christ who's the good steward. It's Jesus Christ who watches over everything with honor, with respect, with purpose, and with obedience to his Father in heaven. He is Elohim. You know, he's that example that we should follow. And no, the key of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulders. So he shall open and no one shall shut and he shall shut and no one shall open. You ever hear that phrase in the New Testament? Revelation chapter three to the church of Philadelphia, the faithful church. I don't want to be the church of Philadelphia. There's so many churches that boast. We're the church of Philadelphia. You know, I want to be that church so bad. You know? And so I set up so many safety nets, you know, 
uh, in this church as far as like financially so that there's no embezzlement, so that everyone's held accountable. You know, I set up, and I'm looking for those people that are gifted in those areas, administrators and accountants and things like that, that, that we can uh, glean from their knowledge and understanding of all that so that we can even be better stewards because I so want to be faithful with the things of God. I don't want to be accused of things. You know, there are times where people will hand me money. Say, here, pastor, this is for you. And I'm like, whoa, I don't even want to touch that. You know, first of all, it's for me or is it for the church? What are you, what are you saying? You know, and so if they say, oh, it's for the church, I go, well, there's a box over there. Go put it in there. Don't give it to me because I don't want anyone to see me taking money from you. You know, now once in a while, and it happens, people are so appreciative of, of the message. Maybe you touch their hearts and they're, they want to bless you. And so they're, pastor here, can you take this I'm like for me or for the church? This is for you. I want you to have this. The Lord just laid it on my heart. And I'm like, well, if it's from you, okay, to me, that's fine. You know, then I have a responsibility to claim that on my taxes, you know, because it's income in a sense, you know. And so that's my responsibility. But you have to be very clear. You have to be very clear on those issues. Um, you, I mean, we want to be the Church of Philadelphia. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. And so that way um, he'll open and no one will shut that door. You know, no one will shut that door. I want the door open to the Lord at all times. I will fasten him as a peg in a, in a secure place, and he will become a glorious throne on his father's house. Uh, they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the prosperity, all vessels of small quantity from the cups to all the pitchers. Again, that's a picture of Jesus Christ ultimately, completely. I mean, just, just the phrase, the house of David. I mean, Jesus has the keys to the house of David. But look at what happens to Shebna. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, the peg that is fastened in, in the secure place will be removed and be cut down and fall. And the burden that was on it will be cut off for the Lord has spoken. Let's go to chapter 23. And so ultimately he will go to the pit. So chapter 23, we have the judgment now against Tyra. Now let's go through this rather quickly, but just to give you some insight. Tyra is an amazing story. You can go to Ezekiel and read the story of Tyra. I think it's chapter 26 through 28. They were like the naval force of the time they were great at ships and, and importing they were commercialized they were making money they were materialistic and so forth and they're being judged because of the materialistic um, attitude but they were invincible in a sense in fact when when they tried to conquer them they literally moved to an island just off the coast there and they were invincible they were invincible completely until uh, Alex, King, uh, Alexander the Great came and then he tried to get them uh, and have them pay him homage and so forth. And they said, no way, you can't touch us. We're out here. We've gone through this before. No one's ever touched us out here on this island. You can read it in your history books too. And so um, he then sought to get them through the ocean with other ships, but they were masters at it, couldn't do it that way. So Alexander the king, who was great at building sieges, he would take debris and just build sieges. Sieges. Uh, you go to the, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, there was a Jewish war and they went to this mountain and when you're up on this place, um, ah, I can't, it's not coming to, Masada, the, 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 the Masada up there. It's way up there in the mountains and yet the, the Roman army built a siege to the mountain and you could see the places when you're up there looking down where they started. They just mount and mount. It took years. But then finally, just to walk up the ramp to the very top. And that's what Alexander the Great did. He just built the siege in the water, just put everything until it crossed right over to the island. And boom, he wiped them out. And this prophecy was fulfilled exactly as God, God predicted here. So the burden against Tyra, wail you ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste. And it is, it's laid waste. Um, again, Ezekiel, it says, it'll wait laced it, that the only thing you'll find there is fishermen with their nets. And that's all you find there even to this day. So there is no house, no harbor from the land of Cyprus in its uh, revealed to them. Be still, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidam, whom those who cross the sea have filled. On, and on great waters of Gain-Shihor, the harvest of the river 
in her revenue, and she is a marketplace for the nation. So very wealthy. They were the ones that were able to bring merchandise in. They supplied David and Solomon with all the woods and cedars and stuff to build the temple. Be ashamed, O Siddam, for the sea has spoken, the strength of the sea, saying, I do not labor nor bring forth children, neither do I rear young men nor bring up virgins. When the report reaches Egypt, they also will be in agony at the report of Tyro. Everyone will know about this judgment. Cross over to Tarshish, well, you inhabitants of the coastland. Is this your joyous city, uh, whose iniquity is from ancient days, whose feet carried her far off to dwell? Who has taken this counsel against Tyra, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are the honorable of the earth? The Lord of hosts has purposed it to bring to dishonor the pride of all glory, to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. And so, again, the Lord is doing this judgment upon them because of their sin of materialism. Be careful, the same thing today. America is so materialistic, isn't it? We're so materialistic. It's just amazing how we're so materialistic at times, how we're so concerned about how we look, you know, what we have, you know, and so forth, instead of being content with what we got. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a big house. It's the way that we approach it. It's the attitude of the heart. It doesn't mean you can't wear the nicest clothes, you know, the nicest shoes or have the latest or you look cool because you have those shoes on, you know. That's not it. It, It's about the attitude of the heart. You know, if you're trying to impress somebody, you're not impressing anybody. You're just following the Joneses, you know, like anyone else. You know, be content with what God has given you and use it for his glory. Paul talks about that in the epistles, about the rich and those who have the means of making resources that is to be used for the benefit of the kingdom of God. That is so important to understand. It's a command that we see there. And and when we start doing that, guess what God does? He starts giving you more resources because he knows you're faithful with it. That's an interesting philosophy when you think about it. And it's one that works because God said it does when we keep it. Overflow, Overflow through your land like a river. O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. He stretches out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord has given a commandment against Canaan to destroy its stronghold. And he said, you will rejoice no more. You, O you oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon, arise, cross over to Cyprus. There also you will have no rest. Behold, the land of the Chaldeans. Now these were the Assyrians. This people which was not Assyria founded it for the wild beast of the desert. They set up its towers, they raised up its places and brought it to ruins. Well, you ships of Tarsus, for your strength is laid waste. And so it was the, um, the Assyrians and the Babylonians that destroyed Tarsus at that time. Now, it, it, in verse 15, we see the length of this judgment. And it shall come to pass in the day that Tyra will be Forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen at the Tyre, as in the song of the harlot, whichever song that is. Take a harp, go about the city. You forgotten harlot, make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may remember. And so we see part of their sin, uh, it's considered harlotry because they're in love with materialism, which makes sense because Paul says that that, that uh, covetousness is idolatry, and that's what materialism is all about, right? Coveting what someone else has because they have a nice car, a nice house, and, and so forth. And so it's idolatry, and you're playing the harlot because you're married to God. Now, Israel was married to God. We, the church, are married to who? Jesus Christ. And so we play the harlotry when we fall into these various sins. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre, She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kings of the world on the face of the earth. Um, Her gain and her pay will be set apart for the Lord. It will not be treasured nor laid up, for her gain will be for those who dwell before the Lord, to eat sufficiently and for fine clothing. Chapter 24. Now we get into... um, 
two chapters that are a little different, not necessarily judgments, but we see a, the character of God's judgment, some variations here upon his judgments and so forth. And then to chapter 25, we see uh, a, a praise song, a song written about the Lord's faithfulness. Behold the Lord, in chapter 24, Behold the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. This is all talking about the tribulation period. This is stuff that's going to destroy the earth completely. Now, what's interesting about this chapter, it's going to talk about the earth literally being moved. You know, when we talk about God creating the heavens and the earth, because Genesis tells us that, if we can believe that, we'll believe everything else. We believe the, the battle in, in Joshua, where the day stood still for one day so they could win the battle. Some believe that the earth literally stopped or began to spin. It was, it was taken off its axis and it began to wobble. Our earth wobbles right now. It doesn't spin completely because of the mountain ranges, the ice and so forth. So it's wobbling as it's spinning around. And that wobble uh, begins to grow like a top, you know, a spin top and it starts to wobble and then eventually it falls. But what happens here is that God... And it's interesting, it wobbles and it's getting worse, but it's like all of a sudden someone just hits it and it starts to spin back on its normal axis and it's back to its normal speed. Then it starts slowing down again and it's like every seven years and then it's like somebody hits it and it starts wobbling again. It's like God's just kind of like keeping it going. And it's amazing. Scientifically, that's how you can uh, see the earth wobbling. Well, during this time, they say that the earth literally began to spin backwards, which stopped the day for Joshua to find the battle. Now, you might think, that's crazy. That's impossible. Really? Remember the earthquake in uh, March 2011? Japan? Eight or almost nine point, which is huge, out in the ocean, the tsunami and so forth. The scientists said that it literally knocked the earth 33 inches off its axis. They measured it. And it slowed down time by so many seconds because of that earthquake. So that earthquake was big enough to cause the earth to wobble, but then it, it shot back into place. So t scientifically, it's happened before. Isn't it interesting how God shows us all these things that are really leading up to what's going to happen in the future? You can look that up on the internet, by the way. I'm not making it up. <laughs> it's amazing, because you think that's a lot of strength and power. There's one, uh, one guy who believed that the earth actually, and I don't, I don't know all the, I, I, I failed in, in science and all that stuff. But uh, the earth spins in, in a certain direction right now. And this guy said that it literally spin the other direction. That there was a planet, I think it was Pluto, that really when you go back to history and look at the Chaldeans and so forth who charted everything, there was no Pluto there. They never saw it. And so they believe that it was actually a comet or a meteor, not a meteor, but a comet of some sort that, that all of a sudden came, hit, the, hit so close to the earth that it spun it around the other direction and it started spinning and then all of a sudden stopped it and now we have it in its place. Now that's interesting. I mean, I don't know that's supposition. That's all supposition. That's his opinion. But he's looking at the history and so forth. That's interesting that God would allow that to happen, that the earth begins to spin in another direction. So who's really keeping everything in order? God is. You know, God is until that perfect timing. So what's happening here is that he's revealing some of the things that will take place during the tribulation period. And show, it shall be, verse 2, as the people, so with the priests, as with the servants, so with the master, as with the maid, so with the maid uh, mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this. So, no matter what your position is, you're not protected during this time. And not many will last during the tribulation period. Pretty much almost everybody, very, very few, will endure the tribulation period. It's not a time you want to be around when this happens. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ now. You need to give him your heart. One thing I didn't like about the movie Son of God, I knew this was going to come up, was when he kept saying, I am, I, am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he cut it off right there. Because when you look at John 14, 6, what does he really say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What is Jesus saying? 
That's radical. There's no other way to the Father except through me. That's what he's saying. So you're saying there's no other way to God? That's exactly what Jesus said. I'm not saying it. Read it. John 14, 6. Read it for yourself. That's what it says. But they kept that out of the movie. Why? People would be offended because you're saying everyone else is, is not going to heaven. I mean, that's the implication there. And so they cut that part out. At least they offend everybody. But yet Jesus said it when you read the scriptures. And I don't care what, um, what Bible you read either. Uh, you can read the Catholic Bible. You can read NIV. You can read uh, New World Translation. You know, any Bible, and that's what it's going to say. No one comes to the Father except through me. Their interpretation may change because the Catholics will say, what he's really saying is, he's saying that I am a way like other ways. Really? That's not what it sounds like to me when you read it. Well, that's what he's saying. That's what he means. Yeah, because you don't want it to say that he's the only way. Well, then Paul understood it completely because he said there's only one mediator between God and man, First Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, and that man is Jesus Christ. Only one mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus Christ. So Paul understood it very clearly. Read the scriptures to find the truth. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. That's the problem, haughtiness, pride. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed, what? The laws of God. Changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. How many are left? Few men during that time. Look at the scene of judgment. The new wine fails, the vine langu languishes, all the merry hearts sigh, the myrrh of the, of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilance ends, the joy of the harp cease. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The, the myrrh of the land is gone and in the cities desolate is left and the gates is stricken and with destruction when it shall thus in the midst of the land among all the people it shall be like a shaking of an olive tree like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. I mean utterly destruction during that time. They shall lift up their voice and they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea, from the ends of the earth. We have heard songs, glory to the righteous, but I said, I am ruined, ruined, woe to me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously indeed. The treacherous dealers have dealt tre very treacherously. Uh, it's not going to matter at that time. I'm calling out to the Lord. Uh, it's it. Judgment is coming and it's final. Fear and the pit and the snare. Now, this is talking about a pit. Where do we see that? In Revelation. Who will be cast in the pit? Satan. The Antichrist. The beast. The false prophet. And everyone else that does not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Why is it talking about a pit? Why is it warning us in the Old Testament? And then warns us in Revelation about a pit. Read it. It's there. Outer darkness. Why would God talk about these things if they weren't true? are upon you, O inhabitants of the earth. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Who comes out of the pit? Satan, Revelation. Look at it too. For the windows of, from on high are open and the foundations of the earth is shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. Read Peter. Second Peter, and you're going to see what's going to happen with the earth, how it will be destroyed. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones. Who are the host of exalted ones? These are the angels who have fallen, who had followed Lucifer. They will be judged. On the earth, the kings of the earth, uh, they will be judged. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit 
and will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Who's going to reign? The Lord of hosts. God Almighty and Jesus is going to reign forever and ever and ever. Let's finish up chapter 25. He gives this wonderful, joyous song in the midst of the tribulation. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I love that phrase. You are my God. How many times have you said that to yourself, to God? You are my God. You are my God. And so whom shall I fear? Why should I worry? If you're my God, if you are for me, who can stand against me? I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Is God done doing wonderful things? No way. This coming week, he's going to do a wonderful thing as we pray in the upper room and we humble ourselves before him, remove all haughtiness and pride and sin and just lay it before the altar and say, Lord, here I am like Isaiah. Use us, Lord in a mightily way, and we watch the wonderful things that he does. For you have made a city ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a place of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. Total destruction will happen. Just like with Sodom and Gomorrah, total destruction. We see that judgment of God. You see it with Noah, then you see it with Sodom and Gomorrah. And how God totally destroyed them and judged them. So judgment's coming. It's coming. And we're deserving of it when you really think about it, right? But thank God for His grace and His mercies that He has towards us. <clears throat> for you have been a strength to the poor, uh, the strength to the needy in the stress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the blast of the terrible ones as, is as a storm against the wall. You will uh, reduce the noise of aliens as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadows of a cloud, and the song of the terrible ones will be diminished. I mean, God is definitely for the needy, for the poor, for the helpless. He's always been that way. He loves them. There's a special place in his heart for them. Isn't that interesting that you can have that same heart as Christ, that when you see someone uh, down and out, you have a heart for them, you know, to help them and so forth. Uh, I was <clears throat> out here Monday, I think it was, or Tuesday, and, and I was on my way home, so I was going out, and this guy's walking along the street and goes, hey, Pastor Reuben, and I'm looking, I'm like, who is that? I didn't know, and so I thought, oh, hey, how you doing, you know, and so I got in my car, and as I'm driving by, I stopped to say hi, I said, hey, maybe you need a ride, and I looked, and I go, I have no idea who it is, but he knows me from the community, so I said, you need a ride, he goes, yeah, let's, I'll, I'll take a ride, so I took a ride, and it turns out that Stephen's been witnessing to him. You know, and so he knows me, he knows the church here. We're a light to the community, you know. And unfortunately, you know, he was on drugs, I could tell. You know, and he wanted a little bit of change and, and so forth. So so we get this opportunity to minister, you know, to these people. You know, they're down and out. You have to feel sorry for them. You have to have a heart for them. I know that sometimes we have a heart, yeah, but it's their fault. They made the choice. I understand all that. But you have to remember, too, that there's an enemy, Satan, who has them shackled. He does not want to let them go. You know, and it means prayer, and it, it means love. It, it means getting God involved in breaking those shackles of these people. And we've had several of them here. We were just talking about a brother <clears throat> that used to come here. And I remember when this brother lived in someone's home here, and he literally lived in a closet. It had enough room for a full-size bed and to walk on the side and boxes for his clothes. And he was tweaked out all the time. Is it tweaked out? He was just tweaked out all the time. You know, I'd go over there in the middle of the day. He's in this room. He comes out all sweaty, but he's high. And, and it, we'd witness, we'd witness. We'd invite him once in a while he'd come. And then all of a sudden, the Lord just took hold of his heart, got completely cleaned. You know, he began to do worship up here, you know, and, and bless people with his bass playing and so forth. You know, and then he ended up leaving. And we were just, uh, brother was telling me that he's doing good. Uh, he's got his truck license, uh, whatever that commercial license is, and now he's doing that, and it's like, wow, God taking him from this place to this place. Can he do it? Yes, he can. He can do that, you know, but it's God that does it because he couldn't do it in his own strength, and the fact that he used his children that were involved in his life. That's what love is, being that witness, 
And in the mountains, the Lord of hosts will make for all people the feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine on the lees of fat things full of marrow. Mm, that's the best part of chicken, isn't it? You know, that marrow is, is that right in the center of that steak and you get that bone. It's like, man, God's going to give us a great meal of well-refined wine uh, of the lees. And he will destroy on the mountains the surface of the covering castle over all people, the veil that is spread over the all nations. He will swallow up death forever. First Corinthians 15 right there, right? O, o death, where is thy sting? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no death. And the Lord God will wipe away every tear from the face faces. Where's that? Revelation 7. Revelation 22, right? No more tears. No more weeping. No more pain. No more sorrows. The rebuke of his people will, he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For on the mountain, the hand of the Lord will rest. Moab shall be trampled down under him as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hand in their midst as a summer reaches out to swim. And he will bring down the, their pride together with the trickery of their hands. Trickery. I like that word trickery. Um, deceptive people. You know, manipulators. You know, always scamming. Always tricking. God's going to bring them down. The fortress of the high fort of your wall he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. You know what he's rejoicing over, right? The fact that God will finally judge the world. He will finally judge evil. There really isn't evil in the world. The reason that men do evil is because there's no God in their life. He's absent from their life. And so what is God going to do? He's going to be present in the world now. So evil will flee because it can't stand good. And God will then rule and reign upon that throne and destroy all evil and wickedness of this world.